2 Samuel chapter number 12. 2 Samuel chapter number 12. Amen. Good to see Ron back with us. I missed him. Amen. Glad you're here. Amen. Good to see you all. Amen. Missed him last week. Good to have Heather's caregiver back with us. Amen. And good to have Gretchen back at some time with her mom. Amen. Good to see you back. Amen. I think I caught everybody. Good to see you, Gene, this morning. Amen. Just glad for everybody that's in the house of God. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him, and he said unto him, There are two men in one city, the one rich, and the other, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing save one little ewe uh, lamb, the Bible says, which he, he, he had uh, bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him. Grew up together with him. That's an amazing thought. And with his children, it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his own bosom. And he was unto him as a daughter. There was a traveler to the rich man, and he spared to take his own flock of his own herd to dress it for the wayfaring man who was come unto him. But he took uh, the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man who was come to him. David was angered great. Uh, David's anger was kindled greatly against the Lord, and he said unto Nathan. As the Lord lives, the man who has done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had, had no pity. Here it is that Nathan the prophet is coming to David and he's going to give him some news. Now, last time Nathan has come to David, he came with him, Sister Dan, with some good news because he told him that the Messiah would be born of his lineage. And how exciting is that to be able to bear good news to someone? But this time the news is not so good. And I need to tell you that Nathan probably was not looking forward to this audience of one, David, who uh, he needed Brother Ron to give the message to. And so uh, he was on a mission, a distasteful mission, if you would ask him. Probably an intimidating mission because kings had the authority in those days, Brother Terry, if they didn't like the news that someone was giving them, that they could just uh, annihilate them off of his head, out of the kingdom, be done with them, kill them, get rid of them, abolish them. I don't like the word, I don't like the message. Uh, if I don't have to see and hear from them, I don't have to think of the message. So you can imagine what Nathan maybe was thinking. And so he had been sent to pronounce judgment upon King David. It wasn't his own personal opinion. It wasn't the judgment of someone else. But it was the stirring of God that had told him that he needed to go and pronounce judgment upon David. David had looked at Bathsheba, who was a married woman. He had not only looked, but he had allowed, allowed his mind to fantasize. And then before he knew it, he had participated in an act with another man's wife that should not have been. And so he calls Uriah home from the battlefield uh, because Bathsheba is expecting a child. He wants uh, them to come together as husband and wife. Did not happen because Uriah said, I can't do this thing while my men is out fighting. And so uh, David gives the very own execution papers to Uriah to deliver, sealed, and uh, he's put on the forefront of the battle. And he's killed because David thinks, well, if I can get rid of Uriah, I don't have to see his face. I don't have to think about him. I'll just get rid of him and everything will be well and will be fine. However, Nathan, God's prophet, God said, Nathan, I want you to go and tell David, I know the sin and the wrong that he's done. He thinks he can bury his sin, but he needs to repent of his sin. I'm not looking for him to hide it from everybody. I'm not looking for him to bury it. I'm looking for him to repent of it. Repentant sin is good. Amen. God accepts the fervent, righteous prayer of an individual who repents of their sin. 
Let me say the Word of God says that, that He cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. Amen. I look sometimes at little old men and little old ladies who are going through the struggles of end of life and they say, well, I think God is punishing me. My question to them is, I don't know your history, I don't know your story, but have you repented of your sins? Yes, I've repented, but God's still punishing me. That's not the God I serve. The Word of God says He cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. He puts them in the sea of forgetfulness. He no longer brings them up uh, to, to uh, uh, punish us, to, uh, to, to make us uh, uh, use it as something to uh, connive us and manipulate us. That's not the God I serve. Amen. God wants a repentant heart. So here's David. He's not been repentant. And so Nathan is being told from God to go and, 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 and to tell David of his sin. And then to tell him that God sees it, that he needs to repent of it. So Nathan in his mind, and I believe it's part in thinking of how he's going to do what God has asked him to do. But also the Holy Ghost is working and dealing with the prophet. And he begins to, to, to think, how am I going to talk to uh, this man David? He said, I remember that he was once a young boy who was very tender, a young boy who could be intimidated, a young boy who loved his sheep, and uh, a, a, a young man who knew what it was like to take care of his sheep because he killed animals that would come to devour his sheep. And so he began to think about this. But this young man, uh, he was a great young man. Uh, he, he was a shepherd boy. And he was one who was willing to defend Yahweh, God, Elohim. Uh, when, when a Philistine came against the armies of the living God, he was willing to stand up. And so here it is that Nathan knew that he was not dealing with this same man who was once a tender boy, but somewhere in his life, the tenderness has been replaced by sophistication. The poorness has been replaced by wealth. Uh, this, this young man who, who was once on the backside of the desert taking care of sheep, now is, is this man who's become a conquering king of Israel, and, 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 and he doesn't have much time on his hands to have a relationship with his sheep the way that he used to have and lies have replaced the justice of this man. He's become deceitful uh, and now he thinks because he's king he has a license to do whatever he wants. It just wasn't that way so many years ago. In fact, in the early reign of King David he was a very tender man. He was a very sensitive man. He was a man who was very open to the things of God and wanted to do what God wanted to do. Remember him in his younger years of reigning? Remember how he wanted the presence of God? Sister Jan? He brought the Ark of the Covenant back. He danced before the Lord. He wanted it to have a dwelling place. In fact, he's, he's talked to Nathan the prophet about it many times, Sister Dietrich. I want the Ark of God to have a beautiful, beautiful place to, that, that it can abide in. So Nathan knew about this. And although he was never able to do it in his lifetime, he collected all the means. And, and we know his son did it. But we know that David had a tender heart because after Saul's reign, he looked for Jonathan. Is there anyone of Jonathan's family who's left? I want to take care of them the rest of, uh, of their life. He was my best friend. I remember that he, 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 he had my back in, in times of need. Where is Jonathan's family? And he brings that crippled Mephibosheth and he allows him to put his crippled legs under his own table and he cares for him. So David was a man who, who really loved God really was a sensitive man, but the man Nathan would be looking into his eyes was not the same man. But that young man has to be buried there someplace. And so Nathan knew that his approach to David had to be good. It had to appeal to the kindness of a man who was inside of him. And so he knew that somewhere inside, if he could present just the right way, it would strum the strings of a man who played a harp and was sensitive and tender to God and really desired to do that which was right. And so here it is that Nathan carefully crafts the story. <clears throat> and he begins to present the story to King David's heart, knowing that the story was inspired from God. And so he begins to tell the story. There were two citizens. 
They lived on opposite sides of the track. They were very different, opposite sides of the pendulum. One was wealthy, the other was not. One had great courage, the other did not. But one small little lamb. And so one had recognition, the other did not have any recognition except for his family. One had popularity, one no one knew. One had prestige and favor and honor and privilege. One did not. One was bursting with produce from his pastures and from his flocks. One was not. And so the contrast of insufficiency uh, versus sufficiency. One family, uh, you can look at it and, and, and had nothing that the, the city had to offer, while another family had everything the city had to offer. And so Nathan's story had many, many things about it, but the bottom line was it was about a man and his land. A man and his land. Mr. Dietrich, the Word of God is awful of that. We look at the Word of God, we find that Abraham and Isaac is wandering up a mountain. And, and Isaac says to one of David to his, his daddy, he said, oh, what, where's the sacrifice? And daddy says, son, behold, God will prepare a land. So Nathan knew this whole uh, history of woe and throughout the Word of God was a land. And then you look at the Passover, and, and there it was that Moses told all the children of Israel that they were to bring a lamb in, and they were to keep the lamb. What did that mean, keep the lamb? It simply meant this, that they were to live with the lamb. They were to cherish the lamb. They were to honor the lamb. They were, they were to have it as part of its house. You know, sometimes I have a little fuzzy creature in my house that can work on my very last nerve when all the girls are in bed and I feel like I finally have a moment and he goes, <laughs> but I still have it. I said, what do you want, Jingle? And so it's putting her up on the bed, or putting her outside, or feeding her, or holding her, whatever it is, there's still something sensitive about that because she lives in my house with me. And so Isaiah, he told about it too. He said uh, that, that, that the lamb would, 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 would bear the iniquity of many and it would be led to the slaughter. John uh, the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. You remember John the Revelator, he was crying in the news came, Weep not because behold the Lamb of God. There it was, Brother David. The Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. Uh, John said this. John the Revelator said he was slain from the foundation of the the world or the conception or the, the, the beginning of the world. God made provisions for a lamb. And so woven throughout the whole word of God, we find Nathan only had the Pentateuch or, or, or the, the, the or first five books of the Bible, but he knew that there was something that God was doing and God was stirring his heart. So it was presenting with David with this story of a lamb. And so the narrative continues. Nathan says, here it was that there was a poor man. He had one man, a lamb. It lived in his house with him. There was a rich man. He had many herds. And uh, there were many of them. And one day the rich man had a visitor, a wayfaring stranger came by. And the right thing to do would be to provide a meal. But instead of going out to, to the field and, 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 and getting that lamb, we find that he did something that was corrupt. Here it was, the poor man, he had one lamb. Let's look at that for a minute, Sister Jan. What's the difference between the poor man and the rich man? The greatest difference, I'll tell you, is this, is that the poor man had a relationship with his lamb. The Bible says this, that the lamb was in his house. It was like a daughter to him. Isn't that crazy? So all you pet, loving, uh, cuddling furries, whatever you have, uh, uh, it's all right. Even the Bible way back in the Old Testament, men were drawn to animals and loved them like one of their very own. Amen. Uh, is that the way you feel about Spotsy, Brother Eli? Uh, he's, he's your own, isn't it? He brings joy to you. Uh, there's some uh, uh, Sister God, you don't know anything about them fur babies, do you? Uh, and I, I didn't think, and John, he's not sensitive to them, is he? No, I didn't think so. And so some of you know all about that. Uh, Pudding didn't have a place in your heart, did he, Sister Dietrich? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So, so they, hey, I, I, I know your stories, but they, but don't act like that big dog jumping up on you. You don't have a real sensitive place in your heart toward that. We, 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 they, they become family members, don't they? And so all of you, most of you know about that in some degree uh, of, of having that pet. And so here it is that, that the difference between the man who had one and the man who had many, the one who had one had a relationship with his lamb. I mean, the, 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 the Bible says that there was that, that passion and there was that connection. I, I don't know. There, there's some boundaries in our house with our animals. Uh, you know, you know uh, Jingle don't get a lot of table food because it's not healthy for her. Number one, uh, she has a food. There's a certain kind of food that we get from. I don't ever allow her to drink out of my cups or my plates or my bowls. She has her own specific. So if you ever come to your, our house, you're safe. All right? But but the Bible says that this this, this lamb ate with uh, them and drank out of their cup. You know, I think drinking and eating what, what, what they ate is what the lamb had. But it wasn't so it wasn't the same scenario. It wasn't the same story. But what it was, Sister Rachel, is the rich man knew that it was time to go to market. And he didn't want to lose any money. And he didn't want to, 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 to inconvenience himself in any way. So he had authority over the man that had one lamb. He saw in the market that man with that one lamb. And he said, let's go take that one lamb. Uh, there, there was no connection for the rich man with that lamb. He didn't care. I mean, uh, the poor man, he loved his animal. He didn't want it to be slaughtered. He loved it. There was a deep passion and a connection. But for the rich man, he had no connection with that lamb. So he said, I want you to take that lamb, and I want you to slaughter it, and I want you to make lamb stew for the wayfaring stranger that is here. And I'll, let me tell you something. For me... Growing up on a farm, my grandma was, she was uh, the, the, the matriarch of the family. And she provided for her family from the farm. But Bobby, when, when her husband was killed, she raised four children by providing on a farm. And my dad grew up in the same way. And so when it was butchering time, there was no problem with, with them uh, butchering the, 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 the steer that was there. However, for me, it was a lot different, Brother Dennis. I gave that steer grain from my hand. Uh, I should have just dropped it in its, in its pail and fed it. But no, I fed it from my hand, and I pet its head. And, 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 and then when we had rabbit beagles that, that we were to sell, you know, I, I every one of those puppies, I didn't want to get rid of because I had crawled in the dog box with them. I had brought them more milk. I had fed them from my hand. I had snuck them in the basement with me. And, and we played and, and, and had a good time. I fell asleep on, on the floor. I in the basement with them cuddled up to me. You see, there was a connection. And so for me and the rest of, of my family and had farming things, they weren't connected. But I was connected. I didn't like seeing all that stuff because there was a connection. You know, there's a big difference between you hunting a deer in the woods and you raising an animal as a pet. There's no connection. Right. You know, none. So here it is that the rich man had no connection with, uh, with, with that sheep. But here, this poor man, he had a great deep connection and passion for his lamb. And when David heard the story, he got angry because it touched the heart of a shepherd boy that was now still within a king who was a warrior, who had grown a, a code in his relationship, in his ethics, in his morals, and his love toward God. He loved God, but, but there was things that he allowed in his life that should have never been there. And he said, that man needs to, to pay fourfold, and he needs to die. And Nathan said, thou art the man. Yes. Thou art the man. It pierced David's heart. That day David died. You read Psalms 51, you'll read of a man that says, have mercy on me. Wash me, make me, create me, cast me out away, restore me, deliver me. See, David, he died to himself that day. He wanted God to live. And really, in reality, if you want to look at the story, he paid fourfold. When you look at his child that he had with Bathsheba that died, you look at Absalom, you look at Amnon, you look at Adonijah, he died. 
But I think the thing that I want us to look at most is, is he didn't have a relationship with the man. And it took him to a very, very bad place. The basic components of what he needed to have with the land were missing. He didn't eat and sleep and drink with the land. There was no connection. You see, it's easy for us to trade a life of holiness for sinful ways when we're not passionate about it. It's easy for us to crucify him over afresh and anew by not living the holy lifestyle that he wants us to live. Because we're not passionate about the land. It's easy to laugh at the jokes of the old that aren't honoring to God. It's easy to take the quick route of being dishonest instead of taking a longer route of being honest because we're not passionate about the lamb anymore. You see, once again, he's not our prized possession. Do you know what made it so difficult for them? On that day when they were delivered from Egypt, it was a difficult day because they had taken that land in and they had lived with that land. It had played with their children. It had been a part of their everyday routine. But they had to crucify it and it meant something to them when they put a, a, the blood of the doorpost. Let me tell you, the blood of Jesus Christ will mean a lot to us when we keep Him as our first prize possession. Amen. We think about Him when we wake up in the morning. We think about Him when we lay our head down at night. We think of them throughout the day. The Word of God means something to us. It's not just another book. Amen. Our relationship with Him means something. It's not just another relationship that we can put on the back burner, but it's important to us because we love the land passionately and we have a relationship with Him. You see, when the world wants to lavish the riches and all the other things on us, we say, I don't need them. What I need is the land. Something had happened in David's life. He was once the sensitive to the lamb type God, but in the middle of a life, uh, he didn't think killing another man was a big deal. He didn't think about having a, 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 a relationship outside the realm of marriage was a big deal. Do you know why? Because he lost the value of the lamb. I want to ask you, how was your value of the lamb? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Is your value of the Lamb today that you think you are worthy of all the glory, the honor, and praise? Or has your life become about hurts and more things? Have you found your life on the opposite side of the tracks of the cross? See, there's something we can't do this morning. We cannot lose our close connection with the land. Sister Holly, if you come with the piano this morning. You see, when we keep the land as the center of our affection, the thing that we're most passionate about, and we cherish him with everything that's within us. He becomes the pinnacle of everything of my life. As we do that, our life will be lived in honor to Him. I simply want to ask you this this morning. How is your value of the land? How is your value of the land? It will change the way that you spend your time. It will change the way of your character because the value of the Lamb is the most important thing in the Lamb. I think as we look at David, we can look at a man and his value of the Lamb changed. At one time, Sister Janet's brother, we were in the house, but he was out taking care of the Lamb. One time, Brother Terry, he wasn't afraid to fight a lion in the bear because he valued the lamb. At one time, all of his days and all of his energies were spent taking care of the lamb. 
I don't believe it was just a job, but it was about a relationship that he had with them. I know they're animals. But it was something he was passionate about. But one day he rose to be king. There wasn't a passion anymore about the land. In fact, it was very invaluable. You know, how about us? Our jobs can become important. Other relationships can become important. Money can become important. Our homes can become important. Just one extra rest can become more important. It's scary when we value something more than the land. So this morning, this word from God is for you to evaluate your relationship with the land. If he lives with you, eats with you, walks with you, talks with you, sleeps with you, your value of him will be important. You won't be willing to get rid of him, but you'll make extra time to be with him. Let me ask you once again before we come to the altar, how is your relationship with the Lord? Come this morning. Come. Say, God, here I am to build and strengthen my relationship with the Lamb of God. You're my everything. Either we'll value Him as everything or we'll trade Him for nothing. Let's take down our heart on the Lamb of God this morning. Would you give her a hand? Amen. It'll change your conversation. Amen. Let's get her and we'll change the pieces you go. It'll change where you put your hope and your trust. Amen. Let's bow.